Coming up on Cronkite News, debate over a controversial bill that could allow parents to bring guns on school grounds. Plus, how a not-for-profit organization provides support and end-of-life care for children and their families. And later, the Rattlers took on their I-10 rivals, the Tucson Sugar Schools. Game resulted in an upset and an ejection. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Maria Stobbs. And I'm Connor McGill. Thank you for joining us. Currently, Arizona law prohibits loaded guns and firearms in all schools, including universities. But that all could change with one Arizona Senate bill. Reporter Madeline Jaskowiak tells us if the bill made progress at the legislature today. Senate Bill 1331, sponsored by Republican State Senator Janae Champ, had its third read in the House today. It specifies that parents may lawfully carry a loaded concealed weapon onto their child's school property, as long as they have a valid permit. The bill restricts a school's ability to penalize a parent for misconduct involving weapons. It reads that the governing board of an educational institution may not adopt or enforce any policy regarding a legal guardian's possession of a firearm. Advocates of the bill say it's a way to protect parents from being charged with the crime if they forget they are carrying a loaded weapon on school grounds. During today's vote, one lawmaker who is a former educator explained why he thinks this bill is dangerous. As an educator, I know that guns do not belong in school under any circumstances. There are too many chances for misfirings or angry shots. Allowing parents to carry weapons into schools is not a solution to many mass shootings in schools we have been experiencing lately. The bill passed by a vote of 31 to 26 along party lines. This largely clears the way for the bill to move to Governor Hobbs to either adopt or veto. In the newsroom, Madeline Jaskowiak. Arizona Christian University is suing the Washington Elementary School District after they abruptly terminated their contract in February of this year. Cronkite News reporter Valeria Rodriguez tells us to why ACU believes it is a violation to the Constitution. Valeria? Earlier this morning at the U.S. District for the District of Arizona, the Washington Elementary School District and Arizona Christian University both chaired their oral arguments after the district decided, decided to terminate their contract due to ACU's religious beliefs. For the past 11 years, the Washington Elementary School District and Arizona Christian University has had a mutually beneficial relationship in which 17 students from ACU have been hired after serving as student teachers. Although WESD has not received any complaints from students or parents of the district, they have decided to terminate their contract with ACU due to their religious beliefs on biblical marriage and sexuality. ACU stated that this is a violation of the Constitution and the decision was a surprise to them. The point is, is that when you terminate a contract for an unconstitutional reason, when you do so because you say, I don't like what your beliefs are, so I'm not, I don't have a legal relationship with you, that's discrimination. And, and imagine the problem that brings, and this is part of our problem. Whether it's the teachers currently in the school district, whether it's the students or the incoming relationship with student teachers, it's impermissible for the government to say, okay, tell me what all your beliefs are, I'll decide which beliefs are acceptable and which ones are not, and then I won't do business with you if I don't like what your beliefs are. That violates the Constitution in so many different ways, and that's exactly what occurred here. In the courtroom, WESD mentioned that this is being used as a preventive measure as, as they want to be able to protect students that may have a relationship with the LGBTQ community. In Phoenix, Valeria Rodriguez, Cronkite News. We continue to hear reaction about Friday's Texas court ruling that would ban the use of an FDA-approved abortion bill. Reporter Alexia Stanbridge is in the newsroom to tell us how the ruling is impacting Arizona. Mifepristone is one of the most used methods of abortion in Arizona. In fact, it was used in 99% of medicine-induced abortions in 2021, according to the report from the Arizona Department of Health Services. 
Today, Planned Parenthood Arizona held a press call and expressed frustration about the potential banning of the drug. They say mifepristone has been approved for over 20 years and is more safe than drugs like Tylenol and Viagra. Dr. Jill Gibson, the medical director at Planned Parenthood Arizona, says she once again is in a position where she has to reassure patients of the safety of evidence-based health care. I think patients are again really confused. They don't understand why if there is good scientific evidence for safety and efficacy of a medication, the federal government would come in and, and tell a doctor how to practice medicine. However, Kathy Herod with the Center for Arizona Policy says the science shows women who have medical abortions have a four times greater risk of complications than women who have surgical abortions. The premise of the lawsuit from Texas is that the Food and Drug Administration did not follow the science that hastily approved dispensing the abortion pill, and that's carried dangers for women. And women's health and safety was not protected. Attorney General Chris Mays issued a statement on Friday ensuring that legal access to mifepristone for providers and patients will not be impacted in Arizona due to another lawsuit Mays is involved with. In the newsroom, Alexia Stambridge, Cronkite News. The U.S. is seeing a rise in sexually transmitted infections as they jumped up by 7% in 2021. That's according to the CDC, and chlamydia accounted for more than half the reported cases, which increased by 4%. But syphilis had the largest surge at 32% for the year. Even more alarming, the rise in syphilis infections passed from pregnant mothers to babies in the womb. In 2021, congenital syphilis accounted for 220 stillbirths and infant deaths. Pediatric palliative care is specialized medical care for children with serious illnesses. But there is a growing lack of access to children's palliative care. I looked into how this problem is being solved here in Phoenix. Madison Wentland discovered something wasn't right with her son Jude when he was just a few days old. He just wasn't gaining weight or eating well. He was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder called GRIN 2D, and she was unsure what services were available. He has epilepsy, he has sleep issues, he's developmentally delayed, and he just suffers from a lot of unknown caused pain. And it was just really a daunting thought to know, hey, we have to do this every day for the rest of our lives without a break. Places like Ryan House provide respite for families who need a break and hospice care to help children during the end of life process. This Phoenix nonprofit helps kids like Jude who have a genetic disorder. We want to make sure that um, our kids across the spectrum, whether that's here for respite or here for hospice, are comfortable. And we want families to feel that way too. Ryan House has eight bedrooms along with activity and therapy rooms and a memorial garden which displays over 400 tiles representing children who have passed. But only two other facilities like Ryan House exist in the country. Jonathan and Holly Cotter noticed the lack of resources after their own son was born with spinal muscular atrophy while they were living in London 20 years ago. We were told to take him home, love him, and don't expect him to live to his second birthday. A children's hospice home in England provided care for their family. And there were 42 of these kinds of children's hospice homes scattered around the United Kingdom and zero in the United States. When they moved to Phoenix, they created Ryan House, which became the second of its kind in the U.S. Ryan was nine years old when the building opened, and he later passed away while receiving care at Ryan House. He ultimately died at 17, a um, little over four years ago at this point. Across the hall. The nonprofit has seen over a thousand kids since its opening in 2010, including Jude, who isn't able to speak, so he shows his excitement in other ways. He takes off the second he gets to Ryan House. He goes straight through the doors and he goes to find his favorite people. And so I know he loves it and I know it's a really special place for him. A study shows every day over 5,000 children with chronic conditions are within the last six months of their lives. As programs like this are emerging, those families are coming out of their homes and realizing that it's not that they didn't have the need, they always had the need, there just was no solution to help them. But families need more options. On the respite side, our wait list for first days, um, we're at about, about six months out. Wetland hopes to see more services like Ryan House across the U.S. There's so many kids just like Jude around the country and they all deserve to have a place to go, including their families. After Ryan's death, Jonathan Cotter helped create the National Center for Pediatric Palliative Care Homes, which works on developing programs like Ryan House throughout the country. 
A Cold War submarine will soon cruise into a at Still Indian School Park. The 65-ton submarine will be an interactive display bigger than a football field. At a press conference, the USS Phoenix Cold War Monument unveiled a future location and concept featuring the cell and router of the USS Phoenix. The USS Phoenix was a former nuclear-powered fast attack submarine. War veterans of all services were at the unveiling to honor and commemorate the soldiers who helped end the Cold War. I think it's important to preserve history uh, uh, and the theme of this monument is learn, honor, remember. Learn something from history, honor the people who served during that period of time and remember the lessons learned. Once the money is raised, there will be a museum-like mu monument where you can learn about the ship and the people who served. And still ahead on Cronkite News, the poppy super bloom is turning most California fields a bright orange. The flowers are expected, but where they're popping up is not. Stick around to see why these poppies are the star of the season. And people are flocking to the fields for social media worthy pictures. Due to pollen in the air. I'll be back with your weather and pollen report. that background. Now streaming on the PBS app, the definitive collection of documentaries from award-winning filmmaker Ken Burns. Hemingway, the man, is much more interesting than the myth. It is a story that Americans have to reckon with. He's got my job, I'm the town. Discover over 40 groundbreaking films that bring our history to life. Stream the Ken Burns Collection now with Passport on the PBS app. Hello, I'm Adrienne Farewell, General Manager of Arizona PBS. We've got so much going on here at the station. I'm Catherine Anaya. I'm Alberto Rios. I'm Chef Mark Tarbell. I'm Ted Simons. We want everyone to know that their Arizona connection starts right here at Arizona PBS. For over the past 60 years, Arizona PBS has told incredible stories of Arizona's distinctive people. We gotta start being more vulnerable with each other. What I love most about being a Latina woman is the passion and drive that I feel. Beautiful landscapes and treasured history. We're doing something that benefits the community. Good evening and welcome to Horizonte. Welcome to Check Please Arizona. Welcome to the U.S. Senate debate. The recipient of the Emmy is Arizona PBS. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications Phoenix Sports Bureau provides students with hands-on learning experiences and opportunities in sports journalism. From covering local high schools, colleges, and the pros, students get the opportunity to go live from our Facebook shows covering local, collegiate, and pro sports in the Valley. From digital reporting, broadcast, social media, and producing, there's opportunities for all. For more, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. The record rain in California is a good thing for honeybees. And that means this year could be a big one for honey production. With honey's peak season right around the corner, we can expect to see production go up in the coming months. Beekeepers are saying all the rain has led to flowers producing more pollen and nectar than usual. This means the bees will be busy making honey for everyone to enjoy. In contrast with the bees, poppies in California aren't taking a liking to that extra rain and snow in the state. The main poppy reserve in Antelope Valley hasn't seen that super bloom of vibrant flowers yet, but that's not to say they aren't still poppying up elsewhere. The iconic orange flowers of California have popped up in the fields all over the state, except the actual state park that serves as a poppy reserve. According to park officials, this might be due to the excess rain the West Coast received this year. Regardless, though, the flowers have taken root. Adoring fans have driven to the trails less traveled to find patches of flowers to take photos. And though the California poppies are gorgeous, those flowers and plants in Arizona have caused a very high pollen count in the West recently. It's been a struggle out there for folks with seasonal allergies, including me, Maria. 
and it's been also tough for those out there. Jack Wu is in the Weather Center with more about our current weather and pollen levels. Jack, how are you holding up with all these conditions? Well, Connor, like you, the, the pollen is not doing me any justice either. And that's because we're seeing a lot higher pollen counts for today and a lot of the rest of the week. As you can see, we have high amounts of pollen coming from trees and grass, low amounts coming from ragweeds, and a lot and low amounts coming from mold as well. And along with this pollen in the air, we're seeing those winds up to 15 to 20 miles an hour. That's distributing all that pollen throughout the valley. And we are also seeing higher temperatures in normal. We know you've been feeling those hotter temperatures today and the rest of the evening is looking a lot of the same sitting in the mid 90s on your way home from work going all the way into the mid 80s to end off the evening now if you thought those hotter temperatures were ending today unfortunately you were mistaken looking at the highs for tomorrow we're seeing a high of 95 here in phoenix and 94 in gila bend going to uh, the high country sedona seeing a high of 79 so haven't broken into the 80s yet and then going into flagstaff we haven't even broken into the 70s with a high of 65. now we look at a low weather map. Our lows in the, in the valley look like the highs in the high country with a low of 66 here in Phoenix tomorrow, low 58 in Gila Bend, and then going back to the high country, we have lows in the mid 30s in Flagstaff. Now, looking at our eight day forecast, like I said, we're seeing those higher temperatures tomorrow, high of 95 tomorrow. Then it quickly dips Thursday and Friday into the low 80s. Then looking at the rest of our week, Saturday is looking like uh, the mid 80s. We have a peak on Sunday and Monday in the high, in the mid 90s, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, we come back to the mid 80s. From the Cronkite Weather Center, I'm Jack Wu. Here's Nick with sports. I'm Nick Hogan. Coming up after the break, I'll have your Cronkite sports report. Former Sun Devil Joey Decord was welcomed back to the Valley as he took the ice at Mold Arena. Hello, I'm Adrian Farewell, and I'm proud to serve as General Manager of Arizona PBS. From Phoenix to the Grand Canyon, Flagstaff to Prescott, and everywhere in between, this station is the best way to remain connected to all that's going on in our beautiful state. So whether you're interested in arts, culture, and music, to local politics and education, we've got you covered. You're watching Arizona PBS, and your Arizona connection starts right here. Now streaming on the PBS app, the definitive collection of documentaries from award-winning filmmaker Ken Burns. Hemingway, the man, is much more interesting than the myth. It is a story that Americans have to reckon with. He's got my job, I'm the town. Discover over 40 groundbreaking films that bring our history to life. Stream the Ken Burns collection now with Passport on the PBS app. Welcome to the Cronkite Sports Report, I'm Nick Hogan. KD was photographed sitting near the Diamondbacks dugout along with other Suns players sporting a Carroll jersey. Carroll's from Seattle, the same city KD started his NBA career before the Supersonics moved to Oklahoma City. The outfielder, who was just six years old when KD was drafted by Seattle, was excited to see one of the greatest NBA players of all time don his jersey. On Saturday, the Arizona Rattlers feature returned to the Footprint Center for the first time this season. And while the Rattlers only lost by six, it's what happened in the final minute of the game that made it unique. Cronkite sports reporter Nicholas Patrisky was there. The Arizona Rattlers were down five with a minute to go in their home opener against the Tucson Sugar Skulls. Head coach Kevin Guy tried to call a timeout, but it took a fan to notice time was still ticking. And I hear a fan behind me say, coach, the clock's running. I look up, there's 30-something seconds left. Went from 50-something down to 30-something, and then they try to tell me that they didn't hear me call a timeout. A furious guy argued with the officials, who eventually told the coach to leave the field. This marks the first time Kevin Guy has ever been ejected from an indoor football league game. We had a chance to win the ball game. We, we know where we're at as a team. We're going through some growing pains, okay? Uh, Drew's hurt, Raina's getting his shot, okay? Uh, you know, I got to learn what he can see and what he can't see. The Rattlers took their second loss of the season, a disappointing finish in front of the home crowd at Footprint Center. But just three games into the year, players are confident they can make the necessary adjustments. 
Uh, I got to communicate better. I got to figure out what works for certain guys, what doesn't work for certain guys. And uh, we got to get on the same page, man, and make these offense, the offenses that we play, man, we got to make them earn it for four quarters and not give them nothing. In Phoenix, Nicholas Petrisky, Cronkite Sports. Former Arizona Cardinals head coach Cl Cliff Kingsbury is headed to USC to join head coach Lincoln Riley on his staff as a senior offensive analyst. After departing from the cards in January following a dismal 4-13 four and four, four and season, Kingsbury is getting back to the game of football. Kingsbury is returning to his college roots with the role at USC. He formerly coached Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes when he was at Texas Tech. Kingsbury and Lincoln Riley were college teammates and both were quarterbacks at Texas Tech. Riley was a backup to Kingsbury. This new role comes as Kingsbury was fired following four seasons with the Cardinals. The NHL's Seattle Kraken paid a visit to Mole Arena last night to face off against the Coyotes. In a unique situation where the NHL plays in NCAA building, Matt Venezia shares what the night meant for ASU alum Joey Decord. Joey Decord is the starting goaltender for the Coachella Valley Firebirds, the Seattle Kraken's American Hockey League affiliate. An injury to the Kraken's backup goalie meant that the former Sun Devil would be called up to the big show in time for the Kraken's visit to Tempe to see the Coyotes. Getting on the ice for warm-ups tonight, just looking around, taking it all in, it was definitely emotional for me. Um, like I said, just feeling like I was such a big part of this and um, being part of that group that you know, really felt, felt like we, we were, as, as Coach Power says, we were the tradition. It's, be the tradition is pretty cool to, to lead the way with that. When Joey Decord graduated from Arizona State University in 2019 with a business degree, he said goodbye to his college hockey days in a building called Oceanside Ice Arena, a rink that's about to close its doors for the first time in 49 years. As I'm sure you can imagine, Decord's reactions coming back to campus here in Tempe with the Seattle Kraken playing in a building called Mullet Arena were certainly priceless, and his former head coach at the collegiate level would agree. He was shocked. He, I mean, he toured it before it was done, and uh, he couldn't believe when I walked him through it and I showed him everything and the facilities and really where our players train and skate and lift and, and, and live every day. He was blown away by it, and he's really thrilled how it, how it turned out. Despite some chatter, Decord did not start in the crease in his alma mater's new home. He has shown, however, that he is ready for the opportunity. A 60-game winner in the minors with a two-and-a-half goals against average over the course of his career shows that it's only a matter of time before this Sun Devil is a household name in the NHL. He's at the stage of development where he's, you know, he's pushing the envelope to become uh, a full-time National Hockey League goaltender. Um, and every time that he comes here, I believe our guys have the confidence in him that, uh, that he can go into the net and play well for us and win a game. Because of the Kraken's playoff positioning, Dave Haxtell said the plan wasn't even to get Joey Decord into this game. However, an opportunity presented itself with a minute left in the game. Seattle up 4-1. to one. The former Sun Devil stepped into the crease. And in a house divided of Seattle and Coyotes fans in this building, Sun Devil Nation in the Valley united to cheer on the former ASU netminder as he stepped into the crease inside the house that he helped build in a full circle moment. In Tempe, Matt Venezia, Cronkite News. Decord is the only ASU player to play in an NHL game this season and only ASU alum to play in an NHL game at Mold Arena. And that's it for today's Cronkite Sports Report. Back to Maria and Connor. Connor, have you ever wondered what happens to unclaimed baggage? You know, Maria, I have it. And in Alabama, this forgotten baggage turns into a new purpose. After the break, the unique lost items on display in a small oddities exhibit. Cronkite News provides students at ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism with the opportunity to gain real-world experience in the newsroom. At Cronkite News, our students produce professional content for audiences by taking on all roles, whether they be reporting, anchoring, producing, or studio production. Each department gives students first-hand professional newsroom experience. For more information, visit cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Stream the best of PBS on any device with the PBS Video app. All your favorite drama, history, science, news, and documentaries, all in one place. Watch your PBS station live or catch up on the shows you missed. Discover new favorites from PBS and locally produced shows from your station. Sign in and start streaming today. Losing luggage is usually very frustrating. I know I get frustrated. 
but an oddity museum is opening in Alabama to create intrigue rather than irritation. They have created a gallery of unusual items found within unclaimed baggage, Maria. From an old movie prop known in the beloved cult film labyrinth to intricately designed silverware, these are just some things found in the new oddities exhibit within Alabama retail store, Unclaimed Baggage. Over 100 items will be featured from the orphaned bags this store has acquired over the years. Some purchases were made all the way back in the 1970s, but the collection has been steadily growing ever since. If you like interesting items, you should look at this more. The exhibit will be open to public next Friday. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.